Okay, um, Art Schubert, RJG Incorporated, you know that from the screen and walking into the booth here. Um, just to straighten things out, this is not about blending colors. One of our people got confused. This is about trying to marry scientific molding and simulation together. It's sort of part one, Cameron over there has got part two, the big guy out in the highway. Um, you can look it up on the schedule. So let's get started. I had a student come up one time in class and said, uh, simulation, yeah, it poops out something, but we never use it, which is kind of the state of the situation. In connecting the shop floor to simulation, the molder sees this, this screen that looks like that, and somebody hands him some pictures that look like that, and there's absolutely no connection. So it's no wonder that they say something like that. The original quote was a little more colorful, actually. Um, so when you sit down, think about what's required to make a part. You've got to make a part, which is a thing that comes out of the molding machine. What goes into that? Let's focus on the part and say, okay, you've got to have a certain quality that comes out of this thing. And so I'm going to split this into three different circles, which we're going to talk about in this presentation as we go through it. What is the three pieces that go in to make a part? The only thing the part sees. It doesn't see the molding machine. It doesn't see the dryer. It doesn't see the thermalator. What is it? In both the virtual world and the real world, we'll put it together that way. So let's tell it in a sort of a series of stories here. So we have a solid model of a part. Somebody generated this thing in CAD, 50,000 wall thickness, nominal wall, polypropylene. Somebody hands this off to a guy named Norbert, and he's got a big simulation machine, and he runs a good simulation. He says, well, a one-second fill time. He always uses that when he runs his simulation. And he produces these excellent results that you've all seen that look like that. And they get to the shop floor, and they run it and the mold fills and it looks like this. So when he's all done, watch the flow front here, stops, and you can catch the other guys over here, see the little guy in the corner, makes an air trap. He's got another air trap up in here somewhere. You can kind of see it wrap around on itself and you say, okay, what, what happened? Why did the simulation predict what happened inside the mold? Well, let's answer that. He filled it in three seconds. And we had a one second fill that was supposed to be really good. That's what came out of the simulation package. The guy in the shop floor set up his molding machine. It fills in three seconds. What happened? What? It's freezing up, right? Basically, that's what it's doing. So when he's runs from the molder, he says, well, we don't want to work the machine too hard. It doesn't sound so good when we go that fast. It works fine for all our other parts. I mean, there's things that people say, you know. Um, the max hydraulic pressure on the machine is 2200. It took 800 to fill the part in three seconds. Is that working too hard? Hardly, right? So really now. Um, or we always use, we had one molder say this. Gary found this the other day. Uh, we always use one inch per second on all our presses. Okay, so, ouch. <laughs> in order to make a part, you need a plastic process. And a plastic process, as we define it at RJG, is what the plastic sees, not what the machine does. It's what the part sees inside the mold, not what the machine does. Simulation predicts that, well, if we want a good part that's not warped, shrunk, frozen, everything else, we got a pretty good shot at it with modern simulation tools. Um, the plastic process has to be translated over to the real world if you're gonna get anything reasonable out of it. Otherwise, you're up a creek. You got a nice plastic process, you built the tool for that process, predicted it, and then when you got to the machine, it's not the same. So we need to translate here, fill time, which can go to cubic inches per second because we know how much goes in. Uh, cubic inches per second divided by screw area. I mean, the math is not hard here, folks. People just aren't doing it. Um, so it's inches per second. You hand that to the molder and say, the machine runs at this many inches per second. Chapter two, 
um, persuade the molder to fill in one second. So this requires three inches per second. Everybody's happy. He decides he's going to mold four parts instead of one in that machine. They can build a four cavity mold. Production wants four cavities, hot runner, and he selects the exact same fill speed. It worked for one, why shouldn't it work for four? And a lot of people are laughing here, but he gets air traps, stalled full fronts, etc., etc., because obviously you put four times the volume in in the same period of in the same fill speed, you're gonna get the flow split into four and it goes four times slower. So to fill all four parts in one second requires four times fill speed. We need to fill it before freezing takes over. At three inches per second, now we have to go 12 to do it. Machine's only capable of going 10. So what do we do? We got a screw diameter, 70 millimeters, 12 inches per second, we get 72 cubic inches. We, we're only getting 60 at 10. So the solution is buy a bigger barrel, right? You buy a bigger barrel, put an 85 in there. And now at 10 inches per second, we have 88 cubic inches per second of material. We can hit our, our target and we can fill everything in one second. And he says, now I can't fill them. Why can't I fill them? Pressure. So the simulation said the injection pressure would be 11,000 psi. Actual pressure of the prototype was 13. The machine was capable of 28,000 psi plastic pressure. 2200, you do the math, you come out with intensification ratio. If you haven't heard those terms before, come to training. Anyway, uh, Intensification ratio times hydraulic, you get 28,000. He puts the barrel on there and he discovers that with this bigger barrel, I only get 19,000 psi. Intensification ratio is smaller. The four cavity hot runner supplier says we should have a 4,000 psi pressure drop. This means we need 17,000 psi to fill four cavities. And we've got 19,000. So now what happens? We're still pressure limited, but at 17,000 is all we needed, but we got 19. Why are we pressure limited? It's that little guy right there. He claims 4,000 PSI is gonna drop through the hot runner system at what speed? With what material? With this, or is it just a claim that's based on experience? So you decided you're gonna go four times the speed. We ended up with not 4,000, maybe six, maybe seven, whatever it took to get through a long stringy hot runner system and the claim that it was gonna make 4,000 isn't necessarily accurate if you didn't run it through the simulation, the whole hot runner system. So now, just to summarize, what's required to make a part is a process made up of machine size, you gotta know what machine it's going into, the real machine limit, speed, pressure, clamp, and so on. The results that you're after. What do you want to know? How many cavities can I mold? What kind of automation am I going to use? What kind of targets am I trying to hit for dimensions and so on and so forth? This guy, Norbert, over here has to have concept of all this stuff that's going on or he hasn't got a chance of even setting the simulation up right in the first place. And that comes from the real world the shop floor, the machine, he, and explanation of what he's, what his target is he's trying to hit. So he's able to create a process, and his process is in simulation speak, simulation think, which is things like cubic inches per second or fill times. He's got to send that over to the machine guy, to the real world, so that that process and that process end up being the same. Hence, Scientific molding in both ends of the spectrum, blending the two together. Just for a summary here, here's some simulation outputs you want to dump into the process setup sheet. All the machine setup can be figured out from your simulation. Melt temps, you already used that, water, linear speed, shot size. These are language that the molder speaks, not the simulator. And then you can also make a testable result. You send him a picture of the part, what it's supposed to look like, 
uh, purge melt temp, when the gate seal is supposed to freeze, make all these predictions and hand it off and say, if you put those numbers in the machine, you should get this. Now, it's not going to happen quite that way. It never does. There's compression and a lot of things that go on, but you can at least give them a starting point to adjust from and work to the next step. Uh, four plastic variables, heat, flow, pressure, cooling. Same old process stuff we teach in all our courses. It's just that they come out different parts on the machine controller than they do in the simulation. Okay, and this is another concept that can push us one step further. When you ship a, a tool maker, ship some old off, you can back compute and say, look, this is the stuff you have to supply to this mold or it's not gonna run properly. The machine needs these pieces. In fact, one of our best tool makers is doing that. They send it, or it goes right in the book. Here's the qualification sheet. Don't put this machine or this mold in the machine that doesn't have this capability or it's not gonna run and I don't want it back. So, the second circle of our, our blending to make a part, we wanna make this part something like a battery cover and you're polypropylene, somebody always throws you an MFI number, uh, dimensions, key specifications, somebody says, here's the flatness number, you gotta make it flat, right? So you run it, to, hand it off to Norbert again, he gets a hold of it, and he says, well, what material is that? MFI equals 10. Well, okay, it's a recycled polypropylene with an MFI near 10. Right, okay, so what do I do? Well, so he goes to work and he digs around and he finds the rheology and PVT curves for MFI near 10. He finds some thermal conductivity numbers, uh, some data sheets that have uh, specific heat numbers, and he's got uh, elastic modulus, the way it bends and warps, and so on and so forth. And great, he builds this model, runs a warp simulation, and it comes out looking like that. And everybody panics and says, well, we can't cut a cavity that looks like the reverse of that, that's ridiculous. So let's see what we can do trimming the top, but that's uh, um, exaggerated by a factor four, by the way. So we didn't make the specification. The top surface is kind of shrinking and pulling the whole part together. So it wants to go like this, or it seems to be doing that. So somebody says, well, let's thin the surface, save some material, it won't shrink so much. It'll freeze off sooner and we won't pull it together. And so he does a new simulation with the new model and it's beautiful. Everybody's happy, it looks good. Customer's happy, Norbert's happy. They go out and they cut this beautiful tool with the thin surface on it. And then they mold the part and it looks like that. And it went the other way. So it's all backwards, the warps backwards. And what happened? The actual thermal conductivity looks like that. It's not one number. It conducts almost twice as much when it's cold as when it's hot. The actual specific heat is not constant. It's different at every temperature. And not only that, it's semi-crystalline, so you have this big wad of latent heat effusion sitting around in there that's not, in, it's not one number. Furthermore, the elastic modulus is different at every temperature. So the way it it pulls on itself and stretches and the viscous modulus changes too so sitting in the mold the way it forms and shapes itself as it cools is dependent on temperature none of that was covered in the initial thing they were all single numbers if you recall so if we use the correct material data with a thicker base as it was originally designed the warp was flat would have been, this is a simulation that was run with the correct material data. Remember the first simulation showed it warping, now it's showing it flat. Because we plugged in the data that's real, not the data that's just some numbers picked off a data sheet. So this is a constant frustration for me when somebody says, well, can you kind of simulate this part? And they send me a, and they send me a data sheet and it gives me the IZOT break test and everything else, but you know, where the heck is the data? So here's another story we had recently. Um, polycarbonate part, 
Hot runner, valve gated. Hot runner wants two shots in the runner, so he kind of keeps the volume of the, he doesn't want the runner full of plastic so it's degrading and so on. He builds a runner that looks kind of like that, and his simulation result says 19,500 PSI, he's got 3,000 PSI nozzle and tip, so 22,500 he's good for this particular machine he's running on. So he goes out to the press with this new tool that he's paid a gob of money for, and it takes 29,000 PSI to fill, because 26,000 is in the runner system, pressure drop. Severely pressure limited, can't fill the parts. What went wrong this time? Boris. No. Not gonna jump on it, are you? Yeah. Oh, okay. Polycarbonate viscosity increases with pressure. It's like a bunch of soccer balls all chained together and you jam them to each other and they won't slide. And if you actually look at the data, the viscosity behavior of polycarbonate with pressure, um, viscosity at low pressure, 800, at the other end, it's nearly double that at 28,000 pounds per square inch. It's nearly double the viscosity that it was at the low end for a given shear, for any particular shear rate. So because it's polycarbonate, because the viscosity goes up with pressure, and it doesn't, these, this is what was used in the simulation. 800 all the way across. So that system got up to 20,000 PSI. Now all of a sudden the viscosity numbers, the simulation he's using are wrong because they don't account for pressure. So the second circle is material. You gotta know the material to mold the material. And you gotta know the material to simulate it. Proper selected, prepared, dried, mix, melt, using the right screw, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all um, outside the scope of this, but that, that's how you get the material to the part or the material to the simulator. Either way, it's gotta be known what it is and how it behaves. How does this relate to scientific molding? Does your incoming material have constant properties? No. There's your typical curve everybody's seen. If we were only to simulate those changes in the material, in the simulation side, just like we do in, we throw viscosity variation at molds all the time in the lab and you say, okay, well, what happens? Especially in hold in the low flow region, what happens when I just throw a viscosity variation on it? What happens to my pressures, injection pressures? What happens to my parts? We can do that in simulation just like you do it in scientific molding. And it's wise to throw it in at the beginning. So we can uh, use the transfer percentage in the simulation. We can change that around to simulate the compression of the material with viscosity, check ring leakage, other things, so that the behavior of your material gets passed down through simulation just as you would do it on a machine. And you get some idea of the variation you're gonna expect. <clears throat> oh, crystallization rate's another juicy one. Um, we have parts that can get pretty dramatically different based on the nucleating agents that are thrown in. They can warp, shrink in different ways, and those numbers can be accounted for in simulation as well. So, what else determines the final part shape? We have a part model. Does that make the part shape? I mean, the guy sends you a model. Here's the part I want, right? Is that how you're gonna cut the tool? Is that, are you gonna throw that in the simulation? Probably shouldn't. You'd probably throw the cavity into the simulation if you wanna get dimensions and everything out of it because it's not the part that you're trying to make. You're throwing the material into a cavity shape. Another one, does the runner matter in a simulation? Um, check this out. Here's the barrel, the tip. We got 1,500 PSI drop in the tip, 12,000 in this little skinny runner. Somebody didn't want to throw away a lot of runners, so they made it really small. And 5,300 in the gate. The parts are really easy to make. There are only 600 PSI pressure loss in the part. So if you just simulate the part, everybody's happy, right? They don't realize that by the time they're all done, they got another 
15, 18 pounds of PSI drop. So, how about the shape of the gate? Are you gonna model that or are you just gonna stick some material in through a hole? Are you gonna model a cone? That's pretty easy, works well. But what if the gate's really shaped like that? It's got a valve pin hanging in there. All kinds of mysterious stuff can happen when you got this little channel with a pin down the center, the shear stresses and stuff inside there build up a lot of pressure, especially if they're 11 or 12 inches long with a pin going down the center. So if you don't model it or pieces of it and understand the performance of all the chains and the purpose you're trying to get. If all you want is the last place to fill, you might get away with it with the cone gate. If you want pressure loss through the part, yeah, you could probably get that. Maybe not all the balances and everything, but pretty close. Do you want injection pressure at transfer? Uh-uh, not gonna get that by modeling the part. You gotta have an idea of the rest of the system. Here's another one for you that's really fun. Two-shot rotary part, ABS, polycarbonate. You shoot the polycarbonate, rotate around, shoot the ABS behind it. So we do our normal numbers, projected area, math, multiply the projected area times the forces. We got 84 tons on that side of the clamp and we got 198 tons on that side of the clamp. Are all the polycarbonate parts the same? Why not? Are they the same thickness? Probably not. What happens to that clamp when you put 198 tons on one pair of tie bars and 84 on the other pair? It gets, it cracks open and then clamps back down on them. So a pair of those parts are thicker than the other pair. So what's the ABS cavity shape? When you go to shoot the ABS, part of the shape is made up of mold and part of the shape is made up of polycarbonate and the polycarbonates are not the same. It's the same thickness, right? So you're shooting ABS into cavities that are not the same. Point of all this is the thing that the part sees, the material sees as it goes in under this process is a certain shape. That's all it knows about. It doesn't know anything about the clamp. It doesn't know why. It doesn't know that the polycarbonate parts are there. It just knows there's a hole into which it flows. So it's as the plastic sees it, you know, the space, the inserts, the channel, flow channels, all the spaces where plastic goes is what it sees. It doesn't know anything about the mold or the machine or the clamp or anything else. So if Norbert's gonna do a decent job, he at least needs a true geometric model of the cavity runner valve gate, and he has to only do as much as he needed, needs to get the desired results. Again, if you wanna know the last place to fill, don't go through all the mess of simulating a runner system. If you have to know injection pressure, you got no choice. So he also has to have some idea of the real world clamp and pressure. So he's gonna report out and say, well, here's what I got, folks. You told me your machine's got this much clamp tonnage and you built this mold design in this goofy way, you're gonna have problems. And they, you're gonna rock the mold, you're gonna create all kinds of issues and so it's important that his knowledge of what a mold does when it's in a real machine is there. So it's required to make a part, three pieces, right? Process, the material, and shape. And all three of those guys have to be correct for what you want to make the part. Um, and approximately, up top here simulation has to somehow approximate the real world or else the two are so disconnected you can't use them so a simulation that looks like a bunch of colored pictures and lines and graphs can be translated to a process setup sheet that matches material and shape on the other end the point of all this is real data from real machines and models to process setup i said that in short Everybody remembers this little phrase, garbage in, garbage out, right? So you know how to prevent that? 